Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Howard. I'm one of the Identity Services Engine Technical Marketing Engineers uh, here at Cisco. And I'm excited to talk to you about some initial ICE setup and operations. So lots of different things we're gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to try and go through basically what I think uh, everyone should go through, maybe like literally the first hour of setting up your ICE node, uh, trying to go through and get things set up the way you think you might use it. Uh, not actually going to do any authentications per se, uh, but just, you know, kind of all the settings and things you need to go through and kind of figure out where things are kept at so that you can uh, get it set up operationally and, and, and ready to run and actually start doing some authentications and things. So we're going to cover um, all of these things here today. Uh, and before that, I wanted to go over the demo environment that I'm going to be using because I actually have very, very few slides today. I'm actually going to spend almost the entire time live in a demo and hopefully things are going to go well for us as we do that. So uh, I'm sitting here at home. I have my home network and I'm able to access ICE out in our Cisco demo cloud or D cloud we call it. And uh, I have access to uh, the virtual wireless controller sitting out in D cloud. It can connect to my um, access point here in my office. Um, I have the ability to access these um, through a NAT port so I can actually um, do these demos uh, without a VPN as well. I could directly connect to them and uh, show, see the GUI and actually perform radius-based authentications um, through, that, through that NAT port. And I say this because we also have the ability to use Meraki access points from anywhere in the world um, being controlled by the Meraki cloud, it can actually send requests into ICE and get authentications done that way. And we're actually gonna see uh, one of those happen tonight um, as part of our testing. And then, you know, almost every customer for ICE has Microsoft's Active Directory in order to authenticate their users and associate them with different groups and allow us to make authorization decisions based on those groups. So we have um, that available to us. We're gonna be configuring that. Um, and this, and then, you know, I can use all these different um, endpoints and things to actually test uh, everything I do. So this is how I actually run all of my, my labs. Um, I also use um, Amazon Web Services with ICE, so I can test things there as well. But this is the basic setup. And um, many of you, if you've been watching the webinars, know that we um, have been doing a lot of things with REST APIs, automation, Ansible, Terraform, things like that. So we actually have a Linux box out there so we can install anything we need uh, to do that kind of automation as well. And I mentioned all of this partly to kind of let you visualize how I'm doing this demo or what I'm trying to set up ICE to do, um, but also because uh, our I know we have a lot of partners that watch these webinars, and I wanted them to know that this is something that's available to you to reserve in dCloud right now. And I wanted to also let you know that dCloud has recently added a feature so that Cisco partners and employees can authorize customers to play with this same dCloud environment. Now you gotta provide all the gear in, in your home and everything to connect into the ICE or the virtual controller, um, things like that, but the ICE, the AD, the Linux box, all that's available to you in dCloud. And we also have another one available to you in Cisco's DevNet. We actually have some, some automation um, labs and sandboxes there for you to play with as well. So if you're looking for a, a way to try ICE and play with it, um, we have a couple of options available for you. And I will also mention that if you just take ICE and you install it uh, onto a virtual machine or onto an appliance that you have, or if you instantiate it in Amazon Web Services today, you get a free 90-day evaluation or trial licenses with 100 Premier licenses and a device admin appliance license. So if you want to be able to play with these things, just like I'm doing here today, uh, you can install it and start playing with it. Use it in your lab as a test setup. So if you wanted to basically do everything I'm doing, but in your lab, just install it and you can go through all of this. And I always recommend customers doing that uh, so that you have an opportunity to build policies, test them, try out integrations before actually putting it into your production network. You can test your scenarios and things like that. It's always a really good idea. So with that, it's time to start our demo. 
So if we start off in, in ICE, if we would go ahead and log in, one of the first things that you would want to do maybe for your first one, I mean, if, if you just installed, you should know what version it is, um, but we actually have this about ICE and server menu item here. And you can see that I'm running version 3.1, which is our latest and our current suggested release for ICE. You can also see that we've installed patch number one on this, which is the very latest patch. Uh, one of the things that um, is good is that you should, we always recommend that you that you keep up with the latest patches because it has fixes and uh, some security improvements. And speaking of uh, security and patches, we recently released one for the log4j vulnerability. And so I'm actually gonna show you how to install that tonight. Uh, I want everybody to make sure that you uh, know basically how to install patches using repositories and keeping up on, on all patches. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, but I just thought, you know, let's start out, let you know what I'm running. And uh, you can see some of the other information here that we have a, a standalone node. It's just a single ice node. Uh, it doesn't, it's not in a, in a deployment with any other nodes. And you can see the default services that I'm running right here. So the other thing that I will share with you is if you go up here, you will also notice we have this little make a wish button. And if you click on that, you can actually submit feedback to our team. Uh, so if you have, uh, you know, you're, you're trying something out um, and it's not working right, or uh, you wish it had a feature that it doesn't have that you can't find, go ahead and tell us what it is. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, our product managers can hopefully put it in our roadmap to give it to you. So with that, where I want to spend my time today is mostly over here in this administration menu. And we're going to start under deployment. Because when you first bring up a node, you know, you got a brand new ICE node. And if you look in your deployment over here, we only have the one ICE node. If you had multiple ICE nodes in a deployment, you would see a list of all your nodes over here. But we just have the one. So let's go drill down into that. And you can see that currently it's just standalone. That's the default, the way that it comes up. If you were going to start making a, a highly available ICE deployment with a primary and a secondary MNT, you'd probably go ahead and, and mark this as a primary, and then you would begin to register the other nodes to it. I'm not going to do that today because I don't want to have to spend the time waiting for it to restart. I, I don't want to waste your time waiting for that, but do know that it does it does a restart um, if you do that, and it takes takes a few minutes for it to come back up. So you can see we have the different services available. We're going to run this as an administration node, um, monitoring, a PSN. All these services are going to be combined together. And I'm actually going to go ahead and enable the device administration service. Uh, this is just a little warning that lets you know that TACAX and RADIUS are older protocols. They are not encrypted natively. They're pretty, pretty wide open. And so if you do run RADIUS over your network, you may want to encrypt it even within your own network. And if you run it across any cloud services or you think you want to run it over the open internet, um, you definitely need to do uh, a DTLS secure tunnel or something like that to secure your traffic. So just keep that in mind that um, these protocols, these authentication protocols, ironically, are insecure um, because they're just they're, they're much older and, and they just um, never, never added that on. You have the option to do it with something like DTLS, but that's something for another day. Uh, I'm not going to enable PX Grid, although you could run all these on the same node. Uh, but what I am going to do is come up to the profiling configuration and take a look at the different probes that are here. Now, by default, some of these are already turned on. Um, DHCP is a really popular one. We get a lot of uh, good information out of that when we want to profile endpoints. Uh, but HTTP is another one I encourage you to turn on. This allows you to get the HTTP user agent information whenever a host connects to one of the ICE web portals. So that's a, a good thing to have. And then if you want to go ahead and turn on DNS, that's a good thing. ICE can actually do a DNS lookup and see if perhaps the endpoint that just connected and was assigned an IP address, if that's a kind of a statically assigned IP address from your uh, DHCP server, then we might know the specific fully qualified domain name from it and give us a little bit more information about that in our profiles. And other than that, you're pretty much ready to go. Uh, there isn't anything else to select. 
um, by default, I don't think. So we can just save this. And that should be all there is to do in the deployment menu for right now. So the next one obviously would be licensing. Now this node, because it's in our demo cloud, has already been licensed. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend too much time in here, uh, but just notice as soon as we turned on that device admin service, that it immediately consumed one of those device administration appliance licenses. Uh, and once we started to do authentications on the network, it would start to consume additional licenses as well. That's as far as I'm gonna go into licensing here today. We have a whole other webinar that we did um, maybe about six to eight months ago on iSmart licensing. If that's something that you want to know more about, uh, then I highly encourage you to go um, into our ICE webinars page or our ICE videos page on YouTube, and you can take a look at that webinar and watch it and, and come up to speed on how we do ICE licensing, uh, especially if you're gonna be migrating from ICE 2.x into ICE 3.x with the smart licensing. So the next thing is certificates. And you can see this node already has some certificates provisioned to it, uh, again, because it's part of the demo. Uh, but don't worry, you have an opportunity to learn all about certificates, as Rigo said, coming up this Friday in uh, the webinar we're doing with Pavan called uh, Managing Digital Certificates with ICE. So he is going to go through everything. You're gonna cover everything in this page. So if you wanna know more about digital certificates, how they work in ICE, um, all that good stuff, I highly encourage you to join that webinar later this week. All right, so then where I wanna start really is with the logs. So nothing really to see here on these basic logs, keep this menu the same, but I wanna start with syslogs. So we have the ability to add one or more remote syslog targets in ICE. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to do that because I have a syslog server that I've set up uh, on my, my Windows Active Directory box. So I'm gonna go ahead and I want to set up a, we have a choice actually of different syslog servers. We can do the old school UDP, uh, a newer, more reliable TCP, or a, actually a secure syslog where it's TCP plus encryption. Um, I didn't get the license, I just used the free uh, Kiwi syslog server, so I can't do the secure syslog. So I'm just gonna do the, the TCP for a little bit more reliability. Um, you do whatever, whatever you have, whatever works for you. Um, and then I'm just gonna say, this is my TCP syslog server. And it's at this IP address. And, oh, Thomas needs to actually put periods, not commas. There we go. Uh, and then whenever you change the different uh, syslog target type, it will change the port. If you use UDP, it's port 514. The TCP uses 1468. And I think the, uh, the secure one uses yet another port, 20 something, I forget what it is. Um, the facility code is basically the severity level that we use and local six is uh, the default, kind of an informational level. I mean, you just leave it there. Um, the one thing you probably would want to change is the maximum length. Uh, so we can send a lot of different messages from ICE and some of them can be quite lengthy when it comes to the authentication messages and the data we give you. So I'm gonna go ahead and use 8192. I wanna maximize all of that data that we get out of ICE for those messages. Uh, I do wanna see some alarms go to my syslog server Complying with RFC 3164 just means that none of the characters are escaped. And uh, there it goes, it'll tell you, um, the, you know, characters will be escaped there. Um, and then the greatest thing about using the TCP syslog is that you get this buffer, right? So if for some reason your connection to your syslog server goes down, we have the ability to buffer the logs um, and we're gonna buffer it up to 100 megabytes of logs. Um, and that the, the amount of time that lasts really uh, is determined by how active your your PSN nodes are how much how many authentications they're doing and how big those logs are. So um, all of the ICE PSNs will send their logs directly to the the syslog server, and we're just going to hit submit. Um, 
Yeah, so it's not secure, I know that, but it's gonna be TCP, so at least it's reliable. So we're gonna do that. And now that we've got our, our syslog server configured, we need to go into our logging categories. And we have all these different categories that we can potentially configure. And the way this works is we pick a category and then we have one or more targets, one or more servers that we can assign it to. And you saw that ICE has a bunch of uh, local targets on its own. So this is all basically within the ICE distributed deployment. It has its own set of servers that it, and collectors that it uses. Um, so what we're going to do is basically add the new server that we just defined to these. And the way we do it is we come in here and we choose our server and we move it over and say, yeah, we want to get those category of logs sent to us. So that's what I'm doing. And so I'm going to pick this for several logs. And did I, do, did I just do past? No, okay, do past authentications. I might do one more. And AAA, yeah, let's get some AAA diagnostics in there. That's got to be good. And one, oh, actually one more for good measure, administrator authentications. I want to see when, when I log in and out of ICE as well. Okay, all right, so we got all those things checked off and you can see over here, basically what we did is our TCP syslog server got added. So it should now begin to receive those, those log messages, okay? Uh, and so if we go over to our server, okay, Oh, look, check it out. It's already getting logs. So just the fact that we were um, making changes, configuration changes, uh, it says, yep, configuration changed. It was user admin. We changed this, this, uh, these different categories, and those are exactly the categories you just saw me do. Now, um, what's more interesting is if we actually did a, an authentication, right? So what does an authentication look like? And for that, we're going to switch over and we're going to try to do an authentication with Meraki. This is why this is why I have Meraki over here. Okay, so this is my Meraki dashboard. I told you that I have uh, Catalyst APs here in my home office as well as the Meraki APs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into edit the settings for my Ice Corp uh, SSID, and inside of there they make it really easy to do a test. And so I've already pre-configured my ICE uh, radius server IP address and the, and the pre-shared secret that I want to use. And now I just need to test it. So I'm going to try out Thomas and my password. And this is totally going to fail. And the reason why is because we have not configured any Meraki network devices, any Catalyst network devices, no network devices, right? So the fact that it hasn't even been configured means that ICE is gonna deny it. Um, but that's okay because all we wanna do is we just wanna test the syslogs and see that the thing is working. So sometimes you just need to test it just to see that it that things are connected and talking to each other uh, and that should be fine. So it's trying and retrying, okay, there we go. APs failed, all right, that's cool. Let's go back over and look at that. We now have our logs and so you can see that we have um, a couple of different logs here where it tried to do uh, a radius authentication and it failed and the request was dropped. And then it says, you get another one up here that says then the, the um, network access server conducted several failed authentications of the same scenario. So basically it retried, right? It tried to, it failed authentication, it tried again. So it's just letting us know that it keeps trying it again and again. Uh, and then you also get a message here that, look, hey, we got an unknown network access device. We've never seen this before. Uh, so maybe it's misconfigured. And now you get another syslog about it being misconfigured. So our alarms are definitely working. This is fantastic. It's exactly what we wanted. So it's that easy to configure your syslogs with ICE and do a quick test on it. All right. So that's the syslog stuff. Um, if you want to know what some of these messages are, if you see one of the messages, you can go ahead and you can come down here and you can uh, filter on them. In fact, if I, sorry, I'm going to flip back and look at what was the actual number. Okay, so I had a 5405 was the message ID and 5435 was the message ID. 
So if I come back in and I filter on message 5405, there it is, radius request dropped, right? Because it, it didn't know our network access device. And then 5435, NAS conducted several failed authentication attempts. Okay, so that's exactly what we saw there. So this is just a, a message catalog. I get I get questions about this regularly. Hey, does do you have a list of all the different messages that ICE will send to my syslog server? Yes, we do. And if you wanna export them, you just click right there and you can download the CSV file with all those messages, okay? Now, the last thing uh, that I wanna show you here with the logs is collection filters. You have the ability to filter out certain syslogs based on certain criteria. So if you are getting um, an excessive number of messages from a particular user or on a policy set name, you just, you don't care, you don't wanna hear from it or a particular uh, a NAS that's causing problems or something, you can filter these things out by going ahead and um, setting a value and then saying, you know, what, what, what log do you want to filter? And again, that will block it so that you don't get those sent to your syslog servers. So that's an option for you. I'm not going to configure anything here. Um, I don't think you need to by default. I just wanted to show you that that was an option. So next, uh, let's get into patching and repositories. This is all considered um, maintenance of your ICE server. So you can see that we already have patch one installed. I told you about that. And the way that we typically install patches is through repositories. And so we're going to add a repository. The first one I like to add is called the, lo the local disk. And this can actually be extremely convenient. Um, I'm gonna show you why here in a second. So I just used local disk, root path, very simple. Submit that, there we go. Um, I also have an FTP server sitting out here. So I'm going to set up my FTP server repository. And you notice that we have lots of different options for you. We just did the local disk. I'm going to do FTP, but you also have the options for SFTP, TFTP, uh, also HTTP and HTTPS are very convenient. Sometimes um, if I if I don't have, if I haven't set up an, the FTP server, I just want to go straight from my personal computer um, over VPN. I can actually just set up a quick like Python web server on my on my computer, grab my IP address, do a quick repository configuration, and I can use, you know, serve up some HTTP, um, some files over HTTP, and it's simple enough, right? So we're gonna do FTP on this one. And again, we're gonna be going to my Active Directory server where I have the FTP server set up. So there, the path, I always use the root. Uh, and then my username is simply ice and my password. Okay, so I'm gonna set that up. All right, so we got two repositories set up. That was pretty quick and painless. Uh, the next thing is we're actually gonna go down into local disk management. So if you have more than one ice node, you would see all the different nodes here and you could quickly go through and you could manage the files on that. So you can see previously we uploaded the patch bundle number one, and we're able to patch the system through here. So it's very easy to come in, perform an upload, and I'm actually going to uh, submit the hot patch for the log4j vulnerability. I'm going to upload that right now, and we're gonna apply it a little bit later. I'm not gonna do it right now because if I did, it would restart the ice box and that would just be dead time for 10 minutes. Um, and I don't wanna bore you waiting for that. So we're going to wait till the very end of, of our uh, webinar for that. So we have just installed our patch. It's not, it's not installed, but it's uploaded, I should say, in our local repository. Uh, we're gonna come back to that, but I just wanted to show you that real quick. So I'm just kind of working across the screen here. The other thing I will show you is operational data purging. So if you ever wanna see how much space your logs are using in your, your ICE node, you can come in here, you can take a look uh, and you can see what the relative size is for um, radius and tack acts. You can purge them based on a, a timeline. Now you may get actually, depending upon how active your ICE deployment is, you may be able to store 30, 60, 90, 
120, maybe more days worth of logs. And so you may want to, you know, change these numbers to be longer than 30 days. Um, and so I'll leave that up to you, whatever you think the right number is. The other thing you can do is before you purge, you may actually want to export those logs to keep them uh, for a longer term. So if you if you know that you're going to fill up your disk within 30 days, uh, you may want to export them and start fresh. And so you can do that by exporting them to one of your repositories, right? And you can encrypt them and all that good stuff. So that may be an option for you. Uh, so I'm not going to do anything here. I just wanted to show you that option before we move on to the next thing, which is going to be upgrade. Now, this is a fresh install. It's on 3.1, patch one. It's got the latest stuff, so we don't need to do an upgrade. I just wanted to show you the screen because we're just working left to right. Uh, nothing to do here, so we're going to keep going for now. Health checks. This is something that we started doing back in ICE 2.x. Um, we had it as a separate tool called the uh, URT, the Upgrade Readiness Tool. And in 3.x, we actually incorporated it. And so now all you have to do is come over here, you trigger the health checks, and it's gonna run through and check for all these things to see if there's any problems. Typically, we use this before we do an upgrade, but you can run it at any time, just like I did. Um, sometimes, you know, you're, your, your digital certificates will expire you know, in your trusted store or maybe your own system certificates and it'll tell you that you got a problem. Uh, sometimes uh, there may be other issues. And so we're still running the check here. So, okay, so all the services are running, we're all good. So health checks are complete. So if we were going to do an upgrade, we could go ahead and, and do that right now. The other thing that's interesting is you can actually download the report. Um, I guess it's going to open it with Visual Studio Code. Let me see. Uh, if I download it, it actually provides some pretty interesting data. Um, let me see if I can bring this over and show you really quick. This is what it looks like um, if I open it up. And you can just see basically what is it checking when it does these things? What is it? What kind of things is it looking for? Um, it does things like, you know, uh, disk throughput, disk I.O., um, checks for deployment validations, FQDNs, DNS resolvability, all this kind of stuff. So it's fascinating to look through and see what it's checking for. It's just a general good good thing to be looking at. Um, you can run it at any time just to see, you know, how your how your nodes are doing. If uh, you had a, a some problems, you were wondering if maybe something else was screwed up, you can you can try to run it and see if there's any problems. Maybe call TAC, have them take a look at it. Um, but that's health checks. Definitely run it before your upgrades. Next is backup and restore. So um, always recommend doing a backup and restore. Um, you can do either configuration or operational, which has your, your logs in it. Configuration is much lighter. This is the minimum one that you want to do. And I'm going to go ahead and configure one right now. And for that, I'm just going to say this is my first backup. And I'm not going to fill up my own local disk. I want to use that FTP server for this. I'm going to specify my password. And note that, you know, it doesn't back up your certificates. So that's a totally separate um, thing that you will need to do. Always store your certificates in a safe place. And there we go. So it's going to start backing up to our FTP server, which is sitting out here. And so over here, oh, here he is over here. All right. Oh, there, oh, there he goes. He's going right now. So he's already um, doing stuff. So there's our um, FTP server. It's progressing right now. And if I go back, Okay, so it's it's taking all the files, um, basically zipping them up, compressing them, all that good stuff, and it's going to transfer them over. Typically, it's about, um, I've seen it's around 200 megabytes. That's the size I get whenever I do it. So that's one way to do it. Um, you can also do scheduled backups. Uh, I highly recommend you do a scheduled backup probably once a week. I don't know how active you are. Maybe when you're first playing with ICE, you're doing lots of changes you want to do 
um, do it more frequently, maybe once a day. But, but it's all depends on, you know, how active you are, how many changes you're making, uh, how many backups you want to do. Uh, so I can't show you that right now because it's, so I should have shown you before I did the backup, sorry. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward to set a schedule um, and your backups will just magically run and set it to run, you know, middle of the night so that it doesn't impact performance during the day. So there's that. The next thing, um, this is where it starts to get interesting and we start talking about administrative access. So the reason I did this um, is because the number one thing that we get that causes customers problems is this little checkbox down here for password lifetime. Um, it's currently turned off um, because it's the number one thing. It's the first thing I do. <laughs> I've already turned it off for this demo. I do not want this password to expire for this demo. Um, but if you just did a, a, a brand new install, this box is checked. And what that says is 45 days after you install, if you didn't know that this was checked and this was a secure default that we put on there, you're going to get a little surprise when you try to log into ICE and it says, your password's expired. You need to go reset your password. And it's extremely annoying. Uh, and so I, this is like the number one thing to go do. Otherwise, I mean, if you want to, if you want to have your local password stored here, you want to change it, do a password rotation every 45, 30 days, whatever your number is, uh, go for it. But, uh, I just turn it off. I'm, I'm extremely annoyed by it. I know a lot of other customers are as well. In fact, what we've done is we have, I don't know if you guys have seen up here, we have this uh, interactive help that we put up here. And it's actually one of the first tasks that we do. So let me show you if I go back to my dashboard. Um, if you haven't run any of these little tasks that we put up in here for you, it's actually pretty cool. I recommend you try it. So we have it right there. The, one of the very first things when you onboard is disable that 45 day password. So it will actually guide you through. So, okay, yeah, let's disable that password timeout. This is going to take us there, tell us where to go, guide us through. And it looks like it's already been disabled, right? We went through that. But otherwise, it would show us, go click, turn this button off, and then we would click save. Um, and then we wouldn't be any, uh, have any surprises in 45 days, right? Getting locked out of our account. Uh, so that's that's something important that I wanted to let you know about. Uh, account disable policy. Um, if you, again, these are all about secure defaults, right? The ICE is a security product. We want to have secure defaults. Uh, so if you want to disable any accounts that you have, if people don't log in after a certain period of time, they're inactive, you can go ahead and disable them. Um, and you can also suspend accounts. So if you happen to have somebody that's trying to do a brute force password attack on your ICE box and trying to get in, you can actually um, take three failures and then suspend it for 15 minutes. Now they got to wait 15 minutes before they can try to uh, authenticate again. So that's a good thing that's on by default. I recommend keeping that one. Um, so these are different, some different settings you can use. Um, the next one is under authorization for permissions. This is all about the role-based access control policy inside of ICE. And the way that we do this is with, um, controlling access by the menus, how you get to the data, and then the actual data that you can actually read read in there. So these are the different um, menus that we've defined and the different types of data that we've defined. And you can put these things together if you look at our administrators, um, sorry, it was actually our back policy right here. This is how we combine these um, roles and permissions together to define what each individual type of administrator in ICE, what they can do. Uh, and so I'm actually gonna try and show you that down here with just the default groups that we have inside of ICE. So these are the default groups. We try to come up with different roles that we think would be typical. So we have things like, um, we'll start at the top here, ERS admin and ERS operator. ERS is our external RESTful services. That's basically our REST APIs. And so uh, the ERS admin can do read and write operations with the REST APIs, and the ERS operator can only read. Um, so it's read-only permissions for the APIs. Then we have a help desk admin. They can go look at the operations tab. They can run live logs, run reports, 
but they can't look at policy. They can't look at the network devices. They can't change anything there. Um, really, really basic. And then likewise with the network device admin, this is the person that goes in and adds, updates, changes the network devices, but they're not in charge of security policy, right? Uh, so they're not supposed to be doing anything there. Then there's a policy admin. Maybe you have um, a security person that comes in and they need to be able to change the policies. You don't want them updating the network devices. Their job is just to deal with the security policy. So you can let them change the policy, but not the network devices, right? So you've got all these different roles you can configure. And of course, the super admin is the one that does it all. That's our default admin um, that we have in here. So what I want to do is rather than having to create, you could come in here and create individual users, right? Maybe we want to give Rego, make him one of our admins. Uh, we could go ahead and specify a password for him. And then down here at the bottom, we could go ahead and choose what kind of admin we want to make Rego. Now, if you have a, a fairly large company, um, it doesn't make sense to go allocate individual passwords and uh, accounts and passwords when you probably already have an active directory or a SAML server or something like that. Um, so it makes a lot more sense to just reuse those accounts. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I support either active directory or we can do SAML based access. I'm going to show you active directory because that's what I have ready to go here. So I want to show you how to connect up your active directory and I'm going to use this little uh, interactive help again. I'm going to onboard and I'm going to join ICE to a Microsoft active directory server. So it's going to guide us through the process here, how we add our ICE to the Active Directory domain. So I want to do that, put it there. And it's just, I'm kind of skipping ahead of what the thing's telling me to do. But if you didn't know how to do this, it would just guide you through the process. Then yeah, we do want to join all the ICE nodes. We only have one node, but we're going to join all of them. And after we put our password and username in, we can submit that. And we should get, yeah, we've joined the domain. So ICE is now part of the domain and click close. And we've successfully added ourselves to the domain. Yay, cool. So that's how that little um, interactive help tool can work. So we've got other things that you can do in here. Uh, for adding devices and creating repositories like we've already done, right? Adding users. So if you're new to ICE and you want to learn some things, there's some great things, some great little uh, skills you can learn right here. It'll guide you through the whole process. Uh, next thing is now that we've joined the domain, the reason we've done it is because Active Directory has a bunch of groups that it puts all of its users into, and that's how we can um, control access or privileges to our network. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. So let's add groups from our directory. And if I just retrieve the groups, I'm gonna get a whole bunch. And if you have a really large organization, you may have thousands or tens of thousands of groups. Uh, I've only have 141, which is still a lot, right? Um, in fact, where is it? There's a domain. It's kind of hard to find them sometimes. There's just so many. So it's easier just to search. I did find, uh, domain admin, domain computers, uh, domain users, uh, maybe employees. Those are so. Those might be some common ones that we would use in doing authentications with our authorization policies and the network access rules. So I'm going to go ahead and use those for right now. But the real reason I came here, right, was for the ICE administrators. So I actually want to add groups, and I actually created them. I created ICE administrator groups that map directly to those groups that we just saw. So if you filter on that name, check it out. ICRS admin, ERS operator, help desk admin. These all look familiar, right? Network device admin. So I'm going to choose all of these and I want to add them to my short list of groups. Cool. So now that I have done that, Let's make sure I saved it. Okay, yeah, we're all good. 
So now that I have these groups, this is my short list of groups in Active Directory that I can now use in my ICE policies. So if we go back to our admin access for administrators and we look at the admin groups, oh, sorry, I missed one thing. First, you have to go back up to authentication and notice we can do password or certs or we can use an identity source. So we're normally doing internal users, right? Like the admin, we're gonna go use AD now. So let's save that. You still have the option to use the internal users, but now we can go into the groups and we can map these groups to Active Directory groups. And so uh, if I had a help desk admin, I would say I wanna map it to an external group. And so if I come over here and I look for my help desk admin, there it is. And I could add an additional group potentially if I wanted to add more than one of those groups. And then I come down and save that. Cool. And then I want to add another one for my network device admin. Let's map them to, let's find my network device admin. There they are. And of course, I'm probably going to have my super admins map that to an external group. Where are my super admins? Where are they? Super admins right there. Okay. So we've done three. That should be good enough. Just wanted to give you some, some variety. All right. Now that I've done that, let's go back to those admin groups and take a look. So what we've done is we have mapped to external Active Directory groups. So if you look here, you can see we have just one group that we've matched, right, for our help desk admin. Um, and what we can, and we've done it for network device admins, and we've done it for super admins. You don't have to do them all, only the ones that you want. And if you have multiple groups that would fit those, you can use those however you do it in your Active Directory. So let's test it. So I want to go... Let's pretend I'm a network device admin. I'm gonna log out of ICE. Check it out. Identity source is Active Directory now. We can always still log in as internal, but now I'm gonna log in as network device admin and my password. And let's see if this works. All right, big deal, Thomas, what's different? Doesn't look like anything's changed, but check this out. Oh, I'm missing my policy menu, that's gone. And if I go under administration, I only have access to my network resources now because I'm a network device admin, so I only get to play with the network devices. I still get to look at some live logs and things like that, but I don't have access to change policies. And look, even work centers, right? I'm totally limited in what I can do to basically just troubleshooting and reports. That's all I get. So that's pretty cool. So that's how you can change people's access to ICE for, for role-based access control. And, um, the, oh, I'm going to need to log out of here because I can't do anything um, to keep showing you guys stuff in the administration menu. So I have to log out. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be Thomas, the super admin. I'm not going to be regular admin. I'm just going to be Thomas now. I can just use my regular Active Directory username and password. Log in. And hopefully, because I'm a super admin, I should have all my menus back now. Oh, good. There's policy. Okay, there we go. I got all my all my menus are back. That's what I needed. So with that, I can actually go in and finish up any other settings, my access settings. Oh, this is a cool one. Um, if you want to do little banners in your GUI or whatever, you can do that, right? Tell people whenever they log into ICE, tell them to have a nice day, right? We can do that. Um, and one's a pre-login banner before you log in and one's after you log in. So if you want to leave a message to somebody, you can do it this way. Um, same thing with the CLI. So we can actually um, leave a fun little 
maybe some ASCII art or something for our CLI logins to ICE whenever we SSH into the terminal. Because we're going to do that in a little bit here. So we can save that. There we go. All right. We'll 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 check that out a little bit later. Um, but anyway, we've got some we've got some ASCII art banners here. So the last menu. Oh, wait, I think I have sessions. OK, there we go. A couple more security settings. So idle timeout, um, maybe 60 sec 60 minutes is too long to, to let leave your web browser open unattended. So it might be a good idea to log out of ice maybe within 10 minutes instead if you're idle. And if you look at session info, you can actually see who you are or how many people are logged in right now. So you can see I'm Thomas. Um, I just logged in. So that's admin access. And now we get into some other interesting settings. Um, client provisioning isn't something I think you're going to do day one. Um, you can use it for, for, for profiling or for um, BYOD, but we're not going to get into that right now. FIPS mode, if you are a government customer or you have a need for really strong security, you can go ahead and enable FIPS mode. Um, basically what it does is it turns off um, certain protocols or uh, ciphers that are not uh, strong enough to meet the FIPS criteria, the Federal Information Processing Standard criteria. So it's just going to disable those things. So um, be careful before you turn it on, know what you're going to lose if you, when you do that. Um, so be aware of that. Then other security settings are for other protocols and ciphers, uh, such as TLS. So TLS 1.0 is pretty old, probably should not be doing it. So let's turn that off. Um, if I were to do that, though, it would try to restart. It's going to restart. I thought it was going to restart my server. I don't want to I don't want to do it because I don't want to restart the server right now. Um, and again, that would take too long and uh, ruin our demo. Uh, but these are some things you can you can choose to to turn on or off. So take a look through there, see if there's anything that you you don't want to allow. Uh, alarm settings you can actually configure different alarms. Uh, if you want to go in and and change threshold levels before when it sends alarms, you can come through and do that. So there's lots of alarms to choose from. Go ahead and scroll through there, see if there's anything you want to do. Um, posture that's more advanced. We're not going to cover that. Profiling. Um, that's something that you would do on day one because as endpoints start to connect to your network, you do want to profile them. I think these are all good settings, and I probably wouldn't touch anything here. Um, so just know that it's there, but don't do anything with it just yet. Protocols, more more interesting settings. So um, if you want to do things like uh, session resume, that can potentially speed up things in your network. So you might want to just come through and enable session resume on these things for the different protocols. Peep has session resume and a fast reconnect option. So go ahead and save that. If you're using TTLS, you may want to do it there as well. Uh, then we've got some interesting radius settings. This particular tab is a bit advanced. I wouldn't do anything with this, um, but know that it's here. If you get certain clients off trying to authenticate and they're failing a lot or just causing a ridiculous number of uh, failures and logs. Just, just you, you can suppress them, basically turn them off for a period of time. This can be really, really helpful to kind of ignore things for a while. So that's an option for you. Uh, I wouldn't do anything there on day one. And if for some reason you wanted to change your radius authentication and authorization ports that we use, you could do that here. Uh, if you want to make it, you know, security by obscurity, you can do that. Otherwise, I don't recommend changing these. You want to stay to the standard ports that network devices know to talk radius and TACACs on. Um, DTLS, this is another option um, to secure your traffic with radius and TACACs. You can actually use DTLS tunnels between your network devices and ICE. Um, don't do anything here. Just keep it standard. Would be my recommendation. Uh, and then... Some other things is you may need to uh, configure a proxy for ICE to communicate out to the internet. Um, you may need to do this so that it can get um, the client provisioning packages, so that it can get profiling updates, so that it can get posture updates. 
Uh, you may need to configure this, this proxy for your lab. So if you do, this is your option to go ahead and configure it. And then uh, the other thing I want to just show you guys real quick, um, SMTP server, you're going to want to configure this if you want actually want to get messages sent out to your guests. You're going to need to configure an SMTP server. Uh, I'm probably not going to go through and do this due to the time, um, but know that we do it. And then, of course, you're probably going to have to use some kind of username password authentication to do it. So um, we have the option to do this. You must configure this if you actually want to have I send email notifications to you or your guests. So keep that in mind. Um, SMS gateway, um, if you want to do that for guests, that's located here as well. Uh, system time, we recommend keeping this to basically just UTC if you have a, a, a large worldwide deployment. If you're only in a single time zone, you have a smaller company, um, then maybe you want to keep it to one of your local time zones. But otherwise, we recommend keeping it at UTC uh, and not changing it. Uh, NTP servers, you know, if you need some, um, what is it? Pool.ntp.org or uh, the NIST um, time.nist.gov. That's what it is. I can't talk and type at the same time. All right. So if you wanted to add some NTP servers, you can use those. And then I love using the APIs. So that's the next thing I'm going to do is go into API settings. And I want to enable these. This will let us do the, like I said, the external RESTful services, ERS, and our newer open APIs that we have. Real quick, we can turn those things on. And then we're going to be able to do our patch. Uh, max sessions. Um, we have the ability to control the maximum number of sessions for your local users and ICE. You cannot control active directory groups. You can only control local groups in ICE. So keep that in mind if you want to do max sessions. Um, and then these other things, light data distribution, don't touch this. This is a great optimization that we added, I think, back in like ICE 2.6. Um, so don't touch this. Leave it alone unless you know what you're doing. Um, interactive help, this lets you turn off interactive help if you don't like it for some reason. So um, that pretty much takes us through the entire administration setup. So what I want to do now is my goal was to show you how to do patching with our um, log4j hotfix. And I wanted to do it through automation. I wanted to do it like run a script and show you guys how that works. So the way I want to do this is I'm going to go over here to my terminal and I want to go ahead and SSH into my icebox. Admin, uh, and just I want to show you the patch. You can't actually get this in the GUI to see if a hot patch was applied. So that's why I'm going into, into this. Ice. Okay, cool. So have a nice day. So that's that banner that we configured previously. So that's working. That's good. All right, now if we want to do these patches, what we do is we can, can we could run this command. Okay, show logging application hot patch. And basically nothing came back. That means that no hot patches have been applied to this release and ice normal patch. So that means that it's probably a good idea to go ahead and apply our um our, our log4j hotfix on this ice node. So what you could do, I'm going to show you the command to do that. If you wanted to apply your hotfix, it would look like this. All right. I'm not going to hit enter because I actually want to do it um, using a API command. So I just want you to know that would be the command that we did. If we were going to use it. I don't want to use this. So I'm going to backtrack on that. And I just want to exit out of here. And when I exit out, there we go. We're good. So now um, I want to run the patch command using curl. I'm actually going to invoke the REST API to install the patch using curl. So that command looks like this. I know you guys don't want to see me type it, so I'm just going to paste it in here real quick. 
So what we're doing is we're running curl. Um, don't care about security. Um, I want to see the output I'm using. This is my my username and password. So there's my super secure Cisco password I've been using all day long here today. Uh, and then I'm telling it that I'm going to accept JSON and I'm going to send some JSON. This is the URL, the REST API endpoint that I'm going to be querying. It's the hot patch install endpoint. And I'm installing this hot patch that is in this repository local disk, which you saw me configure. And now what I can do is hit enter. All right. And like that, hot patch install task initiated. Take a look at the task service API to get the status. So I've got the, the task status command sitting right here. I'm going to go ahead and grab that. I'm going to put it here, paste it. And I got to use that task ID to get the specific status of that task. Basically, I just do it like that and hit enter. Okay, so our patch install is in progress right now. So it's going to take you know a few minutes for this whole thing to go through for ice node to restart, and then we'll um, get a final status. I did it this way because I wanted to show you that we actually have the ability to completely automate this using REST APIs. And if you had, you know, if you only have a few ice nodes, doing it through the local disk on the command line, very simple, very easy to do. But if you had fifty nodes. How cool would it be to have that external repository and you upload it once there and then you just run these commands um, to all 50 ice nodes and it just does the hot patch install, right? All through like a scripted, um, through a script. So I wanted to let you know that that was a possibility. We've done a lot of really cool things with ice APIs and how we can help manage your deployments. So that's really it. That's everything I wanted to show you guys today uh, when it comes to managing your ice nodes. So with that, um, Rigo, oh, it's caught an error because my node's actually, it's installing the hot patch. Nothing, nothing to see here till it restarts. So Rigo, what's going on with our questions? Are we all, all good there? All right, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I think we are uh, good to go with the questions. I just had a look at our Q&A panel here and uh, yeah, we have no more outstanding questions. Our panelists have addressed all of those for our audience. So I think uh, I think we're all set on that end. Okay, let me um, go through a couple more slides real quick and then we'll let you wrap up. So awesome. I did talk about automation. I just wanted to give this, this little slide to you all to let you see all the things that we can do with respect to configuration, automation, getting your ICE nodes set up initially. So we have a lot of new things that we've done in ICE 3.1 with deployment, licensing, certificates, hot patch, uh, repositories, all this backup restore. We've done all this um, in ICE 3.1. So once you get to that version, you can look forward to being able to, to do these kinds of automations. Not everything I showed you today can be automated with APIs. So I put those in that, that hot pink color uh, to let you know that those can't be done. And even some of the settings, we have a few settings there, but a lot of them are still missing. So we're still working on improving those. Uh, but a lot of the things that I think you'd want from day-to-day -day operational management and even you know, deployment upgrade patching, things like that, you can totally do with APIs today. And I want to remind you that we have an amazing community. Um, make sure that you, uh, if you have troubleshooting questions or you want to want to know how to fix something, make sure you provide the necessary details so that our awesome partners and other customers in the community can help you answer your question. If you aren't very specific, they can't be very specific with their answers. So it helps to, to provide details. And then finally, these are the resources that um, hopefully Rigo's already left you with these. And I have a few more here that I wanna share with you. Some of the things that I didn't have time to go over today that some of you may want to know, like um, maybe you wanna use an uh, AWS uh, S3 bucket as a uh, repository or maybe you want to do SFTP, or maybe you want to do SAML single sign-on with Azure AD for your ICE admins rather than an Active Directory. So we support all those things, and we have guides out there for you if you do an internet search for them. And with that, I think uh, we don't have any more questions, and so I thank you for joining.